Okay, welcome back to our continued analysis and exploration of stave three of A Christmas Carol. This is quite a lengthy extract, so I'm just going to remind you again that there are certain annotations which are written in bold. If you're pressed for time or if you've been annotating everything in your copy of the text, those annotations in bold are the most important. They link to themes and so on, and those would be the ones that I would focus your attention on now. When you're going back over the text at a later date, when you're revising, you might want to add additional annotation, in which case all of the notes here will be available for you. Okay, as I say, this is quite a long extract. The timings will be below the video for the analysis, so you can jump ahead to that if you want. I'm going to make a quick start now. By this time, it was getting dark and snowing pretty heavily, and as Scrooge and the Spirit went along the streets, the brightness of the roaring fires in kitchens, parlours, and all sorts of rooms was wonderful. Here, the flickering of the blaze showed preparations for a cosy dinner, with hot plates baking through and through before the fire, and deep red curtains ready to be drawn to shut out cold and darkness. There, all the children of the house were running out into the snow to meet their married sisters, brothers, cousins, uncles, aunts, and be the first to greet them. Here, again, were shadows on the window blind of guests assembling, and there, a group of handsome girls, all hooded and fur-booted and all chattering at once, tripped lightly off to some near neighbour's house, where, woe upon the single man who saw them enter, artful witches, well they knew it, in a glow. But, if you had judged from the numbers of people on the way to the friendly gatherings, you might have thought that no one was at home to give them welcome when they got there, instead of every house expecting company and piling up its fires half chimney high. Blessings on it, how the ghost exulted, how it bared its breadth of breast and opened its capacious palm and floated on, outpouring with a generous hand its bright and harmless mirth on everything within its reach. The very lamplighter, who ran on before, dotting the dusty, dusky streets with specks of light, and who was dressed to spend the evening somewhere, laughed out loudly as the spirit passed, though little kenned the lamplighter that he had any company but Christmas. And now, without a word of warning from the ghost, they stood upon a bleak and desert moor, where monstrous masses of rude stone were cast about, as though it were the burial place of giants, and water spread itself wheresoever it listed, or would have done so but for the frost that held it prisoner, and nothing grew but moss and furze, and coarse rank grass. Down in the west, the setting sun had left a streak of fiery red which glared upon the desolation for an instant like a sullen eye, and frowning lower, lower, lower yet, was lost in the thick gloom of darkest night. "'What place is this?' asked Scrooge. "'A place where miners live who labour in the bowels of the earth,' returned the spirit, but they know me. See? A light shone from the window of a hut, and swiftly they advanced towards it. Passing through the wall of mud and stone, they found a cheerful company assembled round a glowing fire. An old, old man and woman, with their children and their children's children, and another generation beyond that, all decked out gaily in their holiday attire. The old man, in a voice that seldom rose above the howling of the wind upon the barren waste, was singing them a Christmas song. It had been a very old song when he was a boy and from time to time they all joined in the chorus. So surely as they raised their voices, the old man got quite blithe and loud, and so surely as they stopped, his vigour sank again. The spirit did not tarry here, but bade Scrooge hold his robe, and passing on above, this, above the moor, sped, whither? Not to see, to see. To Scrooge's horror, looking back, he saw the last of the land, with a frightful range of rocks behind them, and his ears were deafened by the thundering of water as it rolled and roared and raged among the dreadful caverns it had worn, and fiercely tried to undermine the earth. Built upon a dismal reef of sunken rocks, some league or so from shore, on which the waters chafed and dashed, the wild year through, there stood a solitary lighthouse. Great heaps of seaweed clung to its base, and storm-birds, born of the wind, one might suppose, as seaweed of the water, rose and fell about it, like the waves they skimmed. But even here, two men who watched the light had made a fire that through the loophole in the thick stone wall shed out a ray of brightness on the awful sea. Joining their horny hands over the rough table at which they sat, they wished, they wished each other Merry Christmas in their can of grog and one of them, the elder too, with his face all damaged and scarred with hard weather, as the figurehead of an old ship might be, struck up a sturdy song that was like a gale in itself. Again the ghost sped on, above the black and heaving sea, on, on, until, being far away, as he told Scrooge, from any shore, they lighted on a ship. They stood beside the helmsman at the wheel, the lookout in the bow, the officers who had the watch, dark, ghostly figures in their several stations, but every man among them hummed a Christmas tune, or had a Christmas thought, or spoke below his breath to his companion of some bygone Christmas day, with homeward hopes belonging to it. 
and every man on board, waking or sleeping, good or bad, had had a kinder word for another on that day than on any day in the year, and had shared to some extent in its festivities, and had remembered those he cared for at a distance, and had known that they delighted to remember him. It was a great surprise to Scrooge, while listening to the moaning of the wind, and thinking what a solemn thing it was to move on through the lonely darkness over an unknown abyss, whose depths were as secrets as profound as death, it was a great surprise to Scrooge, while thus engaged, to hear a hearty laugh. It was a much greater surprise to Scrooge to recognise it as his own nephew's, and to find himself in a bright, dry, gleaming room, with the spirit standing smiling by his side, and looking at that same nephew with approving affability. Ha <laughs> ha! laughed Scrooge's nephew. Ha ha ha! If you should happen, by any unlikely chance, to know a man more blessed in a laugh than Scrooge's nephew, all I can say is, I should like to know him too. Introduce him to me, and I'll cultivate his acquaintance. It is a fair, even-handed, noble adjustment of things that while there is infection in disease and sorrow, there is nothing in the world so irresistibly contagious as laughter and good humour. Where Scrooge's nephew laughed in this way, holding his sides, rolling his head and twisting his face into the most extravagant contortions, Scrooge knew that their mouths laughed as heartily as he, and their assembled friends, being not a bit behindhand, roared out lustily. Ha 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 ha! He said that Christmas was a humbug. As I live, cried Scrooge's nephew. He believed it too. More shame for him, Fred, said Scrooge's niece indignantly. Bless those women. They never do anything by halves. They are always in earnest. She was very pretty, exceedingly pretty, with a dimpled, surprised-looking, capital face, a ripe little mouth that seemed made to be kissed, as no doubt it was, all kinds of good little dots about her chin that melted into one another when she laughed, and the sunniest pair of eyes you ever saw in any little creature's head. Altogether, she was what you would have called provoking, you know, but satisfactory too, oh, perfectly satisfactory. He's a comical old fellow, said Scrooge's nephew, that's the truth, and not so pleasant as he might be. However, his offences carry their own punishment, and I have nothing to say against him. I'm sure he is very rich, Fred, hinted Scrooge's niece. At least you always tell me so. What of that, my dear, said Scrooge's nephew. His wealth is of no use to him. He doesn't do any good with it. He don't make himself comfortable with it. He hasn't the satisfaction of thinking, ha, <laughs> that he is ever going to benefit us with it. I have no patience with him, observed Scrooge's niece. Scrooge's niece's sisters and all the other ladies expressed the same opinion. Oh, I have, said Scrooge's nephew. I am sorry for him. I couldn't be angry with him if I tried. Who suffers by his ill whims? Himself, always. Here, he takes it into his head to dislike us, and he won't come and dine with us. As a consequence, he don't lose much of a dinner. Indeed, I think he loses a very good dinner, interrupted Scrooge's niece. Everybody else said the same, and they must be allowed to have been competent judges, because they had just had dinner, and with the dessert upon the table were clustered round the fire by lamplight. Well, I'm very glad to hear it, said Scrooge's nephew, because I haven't great faith in these young housekeepers. What do you say, Topper? Topper had clearly got his eye upon one of Scrooge's niece's sisters, for he answered that a bachelor was a wretched outcast who had no right to express an opinion on the subject, whereat Scrooge's niece's sister, the plump one with the lace tucker, not the one with the roses, blushed. Do go on, Fred, said Scrooge's niece, clapping her hands. He never finishes what he begins to say. He's such a ridiculous fellow. Scrooge's nephew revelled in another laugh, and as it was impossible to keep the infection off, though the plump sister tried hard to do it with aromatic vinegar, his example was unanimously followed. I was only going to say, said Scrooge's nephew, that the consequence of his taking a dislike to us and not making merry with us is, as I think, that he loses some pleasant moments which could do him no harm. I'm sure he loses pleasanter companions than he can find in his own thoughts, either in his mouldy old office or his dusty chambers. I mean to give him the same chance every year, whether he likes it or not, for I pity him. He may rail at Christmas till he dies, but he can't help thinking better of it. I defy him. If he finds me going there in good temper year after year and saying, Uncle Scrooge, how are you? If it only puts him in the vein to leave his poor clerk fifty pounds, that's something. And I think I shook him yesterday. It was their turn to laugh now at the notion of his shaking Scrooge. But being thoroughly good-natured and not much caring what they laughed at, so that they laughed at any rate, he encouraged them in their merriment, and passed the bottle joyously. After tea, they had some music, for they were a musical family, and knew what they were about when they sung a glee or a catch, I can assure you, especially Topper, who could growl away in the bass like a good one, and never swelled the large veins in his forehead, or get red in the face over it. 
Scrooge's niece played well upon the harp, and played among other tunes a simple little air, a mere nothing, you might learn to whistle it in two minutes, which had been familiar to the child who fetched Scrooge from the boarding school, as he'd been reminded by the ghost of Christmas past. When this strain of music sounded, all the things that the ghost had shown him came upon his mind. He softened more and more, and thought that if he could have listened to it often, years ago, he might have cultivated the kindnesses of life for his own happiness with his own hands, without resorting to the sexton's spade that buried Jacob Marley. But they didn't devote the whole evening to music. After a while they played at forfeits, for it is good to be children sometimes, and never better than at Christmas when its mighty founder was a child himself. Stop! There was first a game of Blind Man's Buff. Of course there was, and I no more believe Topper was really blind than I believe he had eyes in his boots. My opinion is that it was a done thing between him and Scrooge's nephew, and that the ghost of Christmas present knew it. The way he went after that plump sister and the lace tucker was an outrage on the credulity of human nature. Knocking down the fire irons, tumbling over the chairs, bumping against the piano, smothering himself among the curtains. Wherever she went, there went he. He always knew where the plump sister was. He wouldn't catch anybody else. If you'd fallen up against him, as some of them did, on purpose, he would have made a feint of endeavouring to seize you, which would have been an affront to your understanding, and would instantly have sidled off in the direction of the plump sister. She often cried out that it wasn't fair, and it really was not, but when at last he caught her, when, in spite of all her silken rustlings and her rapid flutterings past him, he got her into a corner whence there was no escape, then his conduct was the most execrable. For his pretending not to know her, his pretending that it was necessary to touch her headdress, and further, to assure himself of her identity by pressing a certain ring upon her finger and a certain chain about her neck, was vile, monstrous. No doubt she told him her opinion of it when another blind man being in office, they were so very confidential together behind the curtains. Scrooge's niece was not one of the blind man's buff party, but was made comfortable with a large chair and a footstool in a snug corner, where the ghost and Scrooge were close behind her. But she joined in the forfeits and loved her love to admiration with all the letters of the alphabet. Likewise, at the game of how, when, and where, she was very great, and to the secret joy of Scrooge's nephew, beat her sisters hollow, though they were sharp girls too, as Topper could have told you. There might have been twenty people there, young and old, but they all played, and so did Scrooge, for wholly forgetting in the interest he had in what was going on that his voice made no sound in their ears. He sometimes came out with his guess quite loud, and very often guessed quite right too, for the sharpest needle, best white chapel, warranted not to cut in the eye, was not sharper than Scrooge, blunt as he took it in his head to be. The ghost was greatly pleased to find him in this mood, and looked upon him with such favour that he begged like a boy to be allowed to stay until the guests departed. But this, the spirit said, could not be done. Oh, here is a new game, said Scrooge. One half hour, spirit, only one. It was a game called Yes and No, where Scrooge's nephew had to think of something and the rest must find out what, he only answering to their questions yes or no, as the case was. The brisk fire of questioning to which he was exposed elicited from him that he was thinking of an animal, a live animal, rather a disagreeable animal, a savage animal, an animal that growled and grunted sometimes, and talked sometimes, and lived in London, and walked about the streets, and wasn't made a show of, and wasn't led by anybody, and didn't live in a menagerie, and was never killed in a market, and was not a horse, or an ass, or a cow, or a bull, or a tiger, or a dog, or a pig, or a cat, or a bear. At every fresh question that was put to him, this nephew burst into a fresh roar of laughter, and was so inexpressibly tickled that he was obliged to get off the sofa and stamp. At last, the plump sister, falling into a similar state, cried out, "'I've found it out! I know what it is, Fred! I know what it is!' "'What is it?' cried Fred. "'It's your Uncle Scrooge!' Which it certainly was. Admiration was the universal sentiment, though some objected that the reply to, "'Is it a bear?' ought to have been yes, inasmuch as an answer in the negative was sufficient to have diverted their thoughts from Mr. Scrooge, supposing they had ever had any tendency that way. Oh, he has given us plenty of merriment, I'm sure, said Fred, and it would be ungrateful not to drink his health. Here is a glass of mulled wine, ready to our hand at the moment, and I say, Uncle Scrooge. Well, Uncle Scrooge, they cried. A merry Christmas and a happy new year to the old man, whatever he is, said Scrooge's nephew. He wouldn't take it from me, but he may have it nevertheless. Uncle Scrooge. Uncle Scrooge had imperceptibly become so gay and light of heart that he would have pledged the unconscious company in return and thanked them in an inaudible speech if the ghost had given him time. 
but the whole scene passed off in the breath of the last words spoken by his nephew, and he and the spirit were again upon their travels. All right, quite a long extract this one, so I'm just going to go through the key points. You might want to pause, get a cup of tea, take a little break before we go through this. I'll try and make it as concise as possible. So the first part of this extract takes place as Scrooge and the ghost quickly visit several other scenes not related personally to Scrooge. But all of these scenes are connected in a single way. They all feature people in isolated, in physically isolated locations. First they visit miners, then they visit lighthouse keepers, then they visit sailors out at sea. So all quite far-flung locations. And the ghost points out that in all of these places people still have the Christmas spirit, people still know what it is to be festive. And his point is that Scrooge, surrounded by people, living in the heart of one of the biggest cities in the world, how can he possibly choose to isolate himself? How is it that he himself has turned away from Christmas, has turned away from society? So, the first thing to note is that they pass by crowds and crowds of people, all of them rushing to and fro to visit family members and friends. If you judged from the numbers of people on their way to friendly gatherings, you might have thought no one was at home. So, in bold, a key point this. As they continue on their journey, Scrooge sees people walking to join one another, huge amounts of them. So, the purpose of the ghosts, in part, is to show Scrooge the importance of knowledge and conscience over ignorance. Scrooge has been hiding away from the world and pretending not to know what other people's lives are like. The ghosts force him to open his eyes to the world around him. So now he realises how other people celebrate and value each other's company, he stands out in his choice to isolate himself. Scrooge starts to recognise that his views and behaviours are not common, that it's rare to be as hostile and antagonistic to the world around you. So, as we carry on, first of all they go to visit the miners who labour in the bowels of the earth. So the ghost is showing Scrooge that the Christmas spirit is felt everywhere and it brings them together. Even miners who labour in the bowels of the earth join together with their families and sing Christmas songs. Next, they look towards a solitary lighthouse and here the two men who keep the light have made a fire and through their loophole in the thick stone wall shone out a ray of brightness on the awful sea. So again we have that image of firelight and light being a source of hope uh, and we have these two men joining their rough hands together and singing Christmas songs together to keep them happy and to keep their spirits up. So again, this is an isolated location, a lighthouse this time, and here we have these lighthouse keepers singing Christmas songs and celebrating together. Even though here they're not with their families, there's just two of them, uh, they still make time to sing and celebrate together. So we realise that unlike these physically isolated people, Scrooge is surrounded. He has friends, he has family, or people that he could turn to if he wished. Or well, when I say he has friends, he has people that he could make his friends, but he's choosing not to. He chooses isolation, and we realise how rare that is. Um, they then go and visit uh, the scene of, they, they go and uh, stand aboard a ship, and again they see sailors talking to one another, talking about Christmas, thinking about Christmas, humming Christmas songs, and eventually they arrive at Scrooge's nephew Fred's house. Now remember, Fred is the only son of Scrooge's only sister, Little Fan, who died uh, when she became an adult. So Fred and Little Fan are quite similar in their temperament and their personalities. They're joyful, they're happy, they're loving, they're kind. They appreciate family and know what it is to love their families. So the spirit stands smiling next to Fred, and remember, both Scrooge and the spirit are invisible and inaudible, they can't be seen or heard, but he looks at Fred with approving affability. So he approves of Fred's behaviour, he approves of Fred's character. Affability means sort of friendliness, pleasantness. So the ghost of Christmas present approves of Fred's liveliness and joyful nature at Christmas time. Fred, much like the way that the Cratchits embody the spirit of Christmas, Fred does too. He loves his family, he's kind, he's giving, he's generous with his time, with his affection. And the first thing that we hear from Fred is wild laughter. And all his friends and his wife, who is referred to here as Scrooge's niece by marriage, all of them laugh together. And we suddenly realise, uh, as everyone is laughing, and Scrooge is listening to them all, we realise that they're laughing about what Scrooge has said previously, as Fred re reminds us 
He said that Christmas was a humbug. So Scrooge's nephew and his wife are laughing about Scrooge. And this is another opportunity for Dickens to show how Scrooge's character is reacted to by his family. Fred previously was perfectly cheerful, perfectly happy, uh, and sort of refused to be deterred by Scrooge's mean reactions to him. Here we see that this is a topic for, for laughing about with his own family. Now, this isn't an unkind or an unpleasant scene. We realise that Scrooge's nephew Fred is actually quite um, pitying, quite empathetic towards Scrooge, and he determines to be friendly and cheerful to him always. But let's have a look at who Fred is surrounded by. First of all, we get a description of his wife, who is described in this paragraph here as being extraordinarily pretty. Um, and we also hear a little bit more from Fred. So, one of the things that's commented on is Scrooge's wealth. And Fred mentions that his wealth is of no use to him because he doesn't do anything with it. He notes that Scrooge's wealth does him no good. He isn't charitable, it doesn't make his life more comfortable, and he's not generous with it. And let's just reflect upon that. This is the entire reason for being, as far as Scrooge has been concerned, up until this point in his life. He has devoted his life to the pursuit of wealth, material possessions, financial stability, and his own family is saying, it does him no good. It doesn't do a thing for him. Yes, he's rich, but so what? They don't see it as having any value whatsoever, and they don't see that it makes Scrooge any happier in his life. So Fred's wife says, I have no patience with him. But Scrooge's nephew, Fred, again, reiterates this idea that he feels pity for his uncle. And this is a really important point, so this is definitely one to note down. Fred pities Scrooge because the person who suffers most from Scrooge's bad behaviour, from Scrooge's unkindness, is Scrooge himself. He notes that he is missing out on a family dinner together. He's missing out on Christmas celebrations. And what does he miss? He misses his own family. He doesn't get to spend time with them. He misses a perfectly pleasant evening. So it hasn't really hurt anyone apart from Scrooge. His behaviour only affects himself negatively. Fred is still celebrating. And the difference here is that Scrooge's negative behaviour doesn't affect Fred. He isn't bothered by it. Um, he pities Scrooge for it, but it doesn't negatively affect his own life. Think about the scene that we've just read with the Cratchit family, who very much are affected by Scrooge's uh, cruel behaviour, by his unkindness, by his miserliness, by his stinginess. So Dickens is just subtly pointing out here the difference between the attitudes of the wealthy and the poor. Here, Fred says, who suffers by his ill whims? Himself always. He doesn't straight away acknowledge that Scrooge's bad behaviour might have an impact on other people, for example, Bob. As they carry on, and we introduce to one of Fred's friends, Topper, who notes that a bachelor is a wretched outcast, which is quite an interesting comment because he is, he's being ironic, he's being humorous, but Scrooge is really an outcast. He refuses to involve himself with humanity. Okay, so Fred continues to talk, and he insists that he will go and see his uncle, he'll go and see Scrooge every single Christmas, wish him Merry Christmas and invite him to dinner and ask how Scrooge is. So Fred is sort of relentlessly upbeat and cheerful and forgiving. He doesn't, uh, he doesn't become angry, he doesn't become resentful of his uncle's behaviour, he simply continues to be kind and, and loving himself. So again, Fred is depicted as being this incredibly warm, kind, caring individual, much like his mother, Little Fan, was. Um, but he points out here that if it only puts him in the vein, if it only puts him in the mood to give his poor clerk £50, that's something. So he's saying, even if I'm just cheerful enough that he's kinder or more generous to those around him, that would be a result. So a key line again here, a key couple of lines. So... Fred clearly pities Scrooge in his isolation and hopes that he may gradually be able to change his opinion of Christmas and may even inspire him to be more generous with Bob Cratchit. So Dickens presents Fred here as patient and kind with hopes of improving his uncle's character. He's still hopeful that Scrooge may become kinder, that he may change his ways. Okay. After this, 
they have some music for their musical family. So again, this reminds us, Dickens uses this motif all the way through the novel of Christmas time being a time for music and celebration. So just like in the scene at Fezziwig's Ball, Dickens is portraying how music is an essential part of Christmas celebrations and how it brings people together. And think about some of the other scenes that we've seen in stage three. We had Tiny Tim singing um, as we visited those three different isolated locations previously, looking at the miners, looking at the lighthouse keepers, looking at the sailors. All of them were also singing Christmas tunes, Christmas songs. So it creates this impression that music is really a way of creating unity between people, that music brings people together and that it's part of celebrating Christmas. It's a time for being joyful. So the family sing together and Scrooge's niece, Fred's wife, begins playing a song upon the harp, a really simple tune, but he recognises it as being something that little Fan also knew and he starts to become nostalgic. So Scrooge begins to be moved by this music, he starts to have an emotional reaction to it. He becomes a bit more reflective, he becomes a bit more nostalgic in thinking about his past and thinks to himself that if only he could have listened to this song more in his youth, he might have become a kinder person in his adult life. It has a sort of uh, pacifying effect upon him, or uh, it makes him feel more open, makes him feel differently to people around him. Okay, um, so it has this powerful effect on his emotional state, and we can see that Scrooge is really becoming drawn into the celebrations here. He's starting to open himself up to them, and he starts to really enjoy them. So then the family begin to play games, and Dickens points out it is good to be children sometimes. So he's portraying Christmas here, Dickens is portraying Christmas as a time to be light-hearted and unself-conscious, not to be afraid of making a bit of a fool of yourself, not to be standing on ceremony, but to be playful, to be joyful, and to, to enjoy yourself with your family. Like Bob Cratchit, sliding down the hill over and over, think back to stave one, he goes up and slides down this hill with all the other children playing, and he does it something like 20 times in honour of its being Christmas Eve. So in that same childlike, innocent spirit, Fred's family and his friends play these different games. They play forfeits, they play blind man's buff as well, and they enjoy themselves. Okay, so the entire of this long paragraph deals with Fred's friend Topper as he chases the plump sister around while playing blind man's buff. And we see at the end that his behaviour, even though it is sort of lightly scandalous, seems to go quite well for him in the end because they're very confidential together behind the curtains by the end of the game. So Topper and the plump sister sneak off together behind the curtains. But slightly more wholesome fun is also to be found um, because we also have this game afterwards of how, when and where. And you see there might have been 20 people there, young and old, but they all played and so did Scrooge. So again in bold, kind of as a summary of this whole scene now, the family are brought together by their games, and even Scrooge starts to get drawn in, shouting out his guesses. So Dickens is emphasising his message that Christmas is a time to be joyful and appreciate those around you. We can clearly see that Scrooge would enjoy spending this time with his family and recognise how much he's already changed since we first encountered him in stave one. So we start to see that actually Scrooge may not be as cruel as he initially appeared. He's happy when he sees what Christmas time with Fred would actually be like. He's joyful. He enjoys it. Um, and we can see that actually he would fit in quite well because he's not self-conscious. He gives himself up to the spirit of the day, just as his family do. So our opinion of him starts to change and we start to feel a little less uh, that he is this sort of disagreeable character. We start to see that actually there is a goodness within him as there is within everybody. So, the ghost is greatly pleased to find him in this mood, so we can see that Scrooge's transformation is a positive one. The ghost approves. And soon, Scrooge says, here is a new game, one half-hour spirit, only one. Scrooge is begging to stay longer. So he's told that he can't stay uh, until everyone at the party leaves, but he begs to stay one half-hour more. So Dickens here is conveying Scrooge's delight in this scene. We see again how much he's changed since stave one, when you remember he was telling Fred that Christmas was humbug, nonsense. Actually, we can see that it is working his mag its magic upon even Scrooge. So they then play a game called Yes and No, which is like a version of 20 questions. Fred pictures uh, something and everyone else is trying to guess what it is and Fred only answers with yes or no. 
And of course, the answer to this to this game is Scrooge. Fred is thinking of his uncle. But the questions that they're asking, they ask, is he thinking of an animal, a disagreeable animal, a savage animal? So we have this long description of all of their guesses, this listing of the things, the features that they manage to they manage to ascertain that Scrooge has. And Dickens uses this sort of caricature, this animalistic caricature of Scrooge to reveal the mocking way that he's seen even by his family. So they are sort of, they're teasing and they're joking about Scrooge and how hostile he is and so how grumpy he is. But really it's just something else that brings them together. So even though Fred's joke is at Scrooge's expense, yes, it does make him seem mean and grumpy, we don't think that Fred is making this joke to be nasty. He's not doing it to be vicious or cruel. It seems more that Fred and his family see Scrooge as part of the family, but just a particularly eccentric member. So through these jokes, he's kind of being brought into the celebrations. Okay, and to kind of take any sting away from this joke, just to reiterate the point that it's not done to be cruel, um, Fred at the end toasts to Scrooge, saying, A Merry Christmas and Happy New Year to the old man, whatever he is. He wouldn't take it from me, meaning he wouldn't accept me saying Happy Christmas to him, but he may have it nevertheless. So again, Scrooge is toasted for the second time. Remember, he was toasted at the Cratchit's house and now by Fred. And we realise that he's on the minds of those people that know him, for better or worse. It's not too late for him to change his ways and mend his relations with them. He's not so isolated that he has no one. Um, he could still patch things up, he could still improve his relationship with Bob, and he could still change the way that his family look at him and see him. And we can see here, uh, just in this subtle little way that Dickens refers to Scrooge, after he's witnessed these scenes, he is described as Uncle Scrooge as if just slightly he is opening himself up to his family. Now I think that Dickens does that on purpose, partly because it creates a nice sort of symmetry with the previous line, that toast of Uncle Scrooge, but also to show that actually he does still have family. He could still be part of that family. So he has become imperceptibly, so almost unnoticeably, so gay and light of heart, gay meaning happy and delighted, so finally, Dickens reveals a more sympathetic side to Scrooge. He's swept along in excitement at watching these games. He almost forgets that he's invisible. He's shouting out his answers when they're playing guessing games. And aren't we just reminded of young Scrooge, alone at school at Christmas, with only his imagination for company? Here, he has an entire wealth of family that he could be uh, accepted into. So Dickens gradually reveals the transformation of Scrooge's character. We see the sort of step-by-step -step process of his redemption and he's making these little increments, these little tiny steps towards becoming a better, kinder, more generous person, closer to mending his ways. All right, that is the end of this extract. I do appreciate that this has been a long one, but I hope that it's been useful to you. It's really important that you recognise how Dickens juxtaposes these two Christmases, the Cratchit's humble but joyful celebrations and the celebrations of Scrooge's family, so that we can see how Christmas is different for the rich and for the poor. Okay, uh, next time. Thanks very much for all your help, guys. I hope this was useful.